Hello, second grade. Welcome back. Um, I thought I'd kind of ham it up a little bit here. We can have a little fun with this. Why not make lemonade out of lemons here? And we are going to have fun with some of these videos. So I know for myself, one of um, my most favorite times of the day sharing with you guys is read aloud. And I know a lot of you guys enjoy that time as well. So I figured, why not do read aloud here? Fireside read aloud. So we've got our nice roaring fire. I've got my uh, pet here. So if you want to snuggle up with your uh, favorite pet or uh, chickens aren't allowed in our household. So inside. So that's why I have a stuffed animal for fun. I've got my nice comfy blanket, a nice comfy chair. You may re, uh, draw quietly while we read too if you want for old time's sake or just uh, take this time to relax. Let your parents get some other stuff done around the house. Maybe they're working from home and frantically trying to homeschool you and get stuff done. So let's give them a break. Let's spend some time together and uh, enjoy our reading. Remember, we are reading Boxcar Children, and we just kind of got this started when, we, um, when I left you guys. This is called the Boxcar Children's Spring Special, The Mystery in Washington, D.C. We were a couple pages into chapter two, so um, to recap, I figured we'd just start back off at chapter two. Um, this is titled Welcome to Washington. Now remember in this book, uh, the four siblings are now living with their grandfather. They still have the boxcar in the backyard um, so that they can go and play there. But now they get to travel and explore the wonderful United States of America. And so in this book, it sounds like they are going to Washington, D.C. So chapter two, we are leading off where they are just arriving to Washington. All right, let's listen. Chapter two, welcome to Washington. Did you remember to bring the camera? Violet asked Jesse the next morning. They had just finished a huge breakfast of bacon, eggs, and waffles, and were waiting in the front hallway for the rest of the group to join them. Mm -hmm. Jesse patted her shoulder back. It's right here, but we need to pick up some film. And I think we'd better buy some stamps. Benny wants to send postcards to Mrs. McGregor, Aunt Jane, and Uncle Andy, cousins Joe, Alice, and Sue Lee. Everyone he knows. <laughs> if you need stamps, I've got a brand new roll, Mrs. Parsons said. She was sitting on a high stool behind the reception desk, working on her accounts. She opened her desk drawer and frowned. Well, that's funny. I could have sworn it was here yesterday. We can buy some for you, Jessie offered. That would be a big help. I'll give you some money and put from petty cash. She pulled open another drawer and shook her head in dismay. Now that's really strange. I know I put a $10 bill in here yesterday. I'm beginning to think that I'm imagining things. What are you imagining, Mrs. Parsons? A young man said good naturedly. He was tall and thin with sandy brown hair and glasses. Oh, I'm just missing a few things from the front desk. You haven't seen a roll of stamps and a $10 bill, have you, Peter? No, I haven't, he said, but I was really busy yesterday. There were people coming, coming and going all day long. Well, it's not important, Mrs. Parson reassured him. I want you to meet our new guests, the Aldens, Jesse and Violet. This is Peter Marshall, my assistant. He does everything for me. Mostly I answer the phone and help out in the kitchen. Peter shook hands with them. Peter's a full-time student, Mrs. Parsons said proudly. He's studying to be an engineer. Wow, like on a train, Benny yelled from the stairwell. He thundered down the last few steps and smiled up at Peter. I'm afraid I won't be that kind of an engineer, Peter said as everyone laughed. He bent down so he was on eye level with Benny. But I'm learning how to design airplanes. So if you want an extra special tour of the Air and Space Museum, I'll be your guide. We're going there tomorrow, Henry said, appearing with Amira. Tell you what, Peter said, consulting an appointment book. I'm free from 12 to 2. Why don't we meet in the museum cafeteria at noon? Benny's eyes lit up. The cafeteria sounds great. 
Jessie grinned at Peter. You couldn't have picked a better spot. Where shall we start? Violet said 20 minutes later. There are so many things to see here. They had walked down a leafy side street to the Smithsonian and had just arrived at the reflecting pool. There were four bronze lions surrounding them and bright sunlight was bouncing off the water. A few people had stopped to feed the seagulls that swooped down, squawking for food. It looks like we're at the south end of the mall, Henry said. There's the capital right behind us. And you see that tall tower in the distance, Benny said? That's the Washington Monument. Do you remember a little while back when we were studying social studies, we were looking at some of these monuments in Washington, D.C. within our social studies stuff. So that's kind of fun that now we're talking about it in our Read Aloud. All right, back to the story. Can we go up inside it? Benny asked excitedly. Maybe this afternoon, Jesse said. But right now, why don't we take a tour of the Capitol? I want to go way up inside the dome. Benny pointed to the top of the gleaming, gleaming white building. Let's go inside the rotunda right now, Amira said suddenly. I think they're starting a tour. She followed a group of tourists through a set of bronze doors and led the way into the rotunda, a huge circular hall. I'm afraid you can't go up into the dome, Benny, but look up at the very top. There's a fresco. Benny arched his head back so far, he nearly toppled over. What's a fresco? He peered upward in amazement. The dome was much bigger than he had realized. It's a painting they do on wet plaster, Henry said. We learned about it in school. That's George Washington up at the very top, Amira said, keeping her voice low. The tour guide was explaining that the dome was as high as an 18-story building. So that's very, very tall. It's beautiful, Violet said in awe. There were intricate carvings and paintings all the way up to the top of the dome. How did someone paint all that, she wondered. The artist had to rig up scaffolding and lie on his back. Amira said, as if reading her thoughts. His name was Constantino uh, Brumidi. You really know a lot, Jesse said admiringly. Amira gave a shy smile. I'm interested in history, that's all. After they looked at the rotunda, Henry and Benny headed for the floors of the House and Senate, while the girls took a look at the old Senate chamber. It's so little, Violet said in a hushed voice. It's hard to believe that all the senators could fit into one little room. I guess Congress was much smaller in the old days. A lot of important things happened here, Jessie reminded her. The chamber was a beautiful room with red velvet carpeting and soft gas lights. After a while, the boys joined them. We saw the House floor and the Senate floor, but nobody was there, Benny said. I thought there would be lots of speeches going on. Congress isn't in session today, and Myra spoke up. That's why the flaps weren't up outside. When everyone turned to look at her, she explained, when either the House or the Senate meets, it flies its own flag outside. You know the part I liked the best about the Senate, Benny said as they headed back to the rotunda. They had wooden desks, just like you see in school. And I noticed something else, he added. Some of the senators had even carved their initials in them. Violet and Jesse laughed. Sometimes Benny had a way of noticing things that no one else did. Later on, the, later on the way to lunch, Violet asked a question and Amira surprised them again by her knowledge. <clears throat> what's e, e plur, excuse me, what's e pluribus unum mean, she asked. E pluribus unum, Amira said quickly. That's Latin, Violet. That means one out of many. They sure use it on a lot of plaques and decorations. And Myra nodded. It's what America stands for. One out of many, one country out of many states. Oh, I get it, Benny said. That's a good slogan. We have to take Sue Lee here one day so she can learn about the United States government, said Henry. Sue Lee was a little girl from Korea that cousin Joe and Alice had adopted. When they were standing in line at the Capitol cafeteria, Violet noticed that Amira seemed a little uneasy. What's the matter? Violet joked. Don't you see anything you like on the menu? Oh, it's not that. It all looks delicious. Amira pushed her tray next to Violet's. 
which was exactly the same lunch, macaroni and cheese. Could you hand me those fish sticks, Amara? Benny asked. He was standing on tiptoe, but the plate was just out of reach. Sure, but I... What did you ask for? Fish sticks, he repeated, right there. He tapped the glass window in front of her. Amira hesitated. Now I see them, fish sticks. She reached for a plate of french fries and plucked it on his tray. Benny looked up at her, puzzled. I love french fries, but you forgot the fish sticks. I'll get them, Jesse said quickly. Here you go, Benny. They moved quickly to the cashier, and Amira looked embarrassed. Jesse looked at her new friend thoughtfully. It seemed that Amira had never seen or heard of fish sticks before. What does your father do, Amira? Henry asked when they were settled at a table. He's in business. Amira ducked her head and began eating quickly. Really? Henry persisted. What kind? It's hard to explain, he said, she said slowly. She sounded uncomfortable and looked nervously at the group. He's in foreign business, international business. He must travel a lot, Jesse said. It must be fun going with him. Oh, I usually don't travel at all, Amira told her. What kind of music do you like, Jesse asked. I, I don't listen to music, Amira said quickly. You don't listen to music? Benny was amazed. No, I don't. Before anyone could ask her any more questions, Amira grabbed the guidebook and began reading aloud about the capital. Violet only half listened her mind racing. Amira seemed to know a lot about history and almost nothing about everyday things. And she obviously didn't want to talk about herself. Their new friend was very mysterious. Henry was thinking too. He noticed a pair of men in dark suits who were sitting a few tables away. They were both reading newspapers, but they glanced over at the Aldens every now and then. Henry knew he had seen them before. They had been right behind Benny in the cafeteria line. There was nothing unusual about that, he told himself. He realized and began eating, and then suddenly it dawned on him. The men in dark suits had been right behind them, strolling up the Capitol steps. And he was sure he had spotted them walking along the same leafy side street toward the Smithsonian. He closed his eyes and tried to remember. Yes, it was definitely them. One hand had a mustache, and one had a funny way of walking with his elbow jutting out. These were the same men. But why were they following the Altons? Henry looked over at one of the men just before he ducked his head back behind his newspaper. Yes, there was something going on. They were in the middle of a new mystery. And that is the end of that chapter. Next week, we'll read chapter three titled, We're Being Followed. All right, until next time, we'll see you guys later.